Today's subject is, as you see written on the blackboard, Swami Vivekananda and Human Excellence. For any educational institution, the subject of Human Excellence is most inspiring. For what else is education except to turn out human excellence? And Swami Vivekananda's name added to the subject makes it still more excellent because he himself was a remarkable example of human excellence. I especially stress this word human excellence because till now we were having excellence limited by either country, race, religion or region, various cultural backgrounds give us certain types of excellence. In Swami Vivekananda you get something very unique, what we call human excellence. And every writer on Vivekananda, including the great French biographer, Marcia Romarola, they have specially stressed this quality of Vivekananda's greatness. He was the harmony of all human greatness. I am quoting his own words in his life of Vivekananda. Equilibrium and synthesis were the keynotes of Swami Vivekananda's personality. He had harmonized within himself all the four yogas. Also action and contemplation, reason and faith. And the last sentence he says, Vivekananda of the harmony of all human energy. That's an extraordinary tribute, the harmony of all human energy. He combined within himself the best of East and West. One of my lectures is entitled The Meeting of East and West in Swami Vivekananda that will come in the second volume of this eternal values. What is that type of excellence where you overcome these limitations, creed, race, language, region? In Swamiji's life, there is that education available to us. How did he achieve this wonderful human excellence? That is the beauty of a biography. When you read the biography of great people, we learn how they developed their personalities, the formative influences that went to make them great. And when you study Vivekananda's formative influences, they were essentially two, Indian influences, modern Western influences. Both went to make Swami Vivekananda. So far as Indian influences are concerned, they came to him primarily from his great teacher, Sri Ramakrishna. The deepening of his spiritual awareness, the broadening of his human sympathies, he got from Sri Ramakrishna. His rational mind, his humanism, these he got from his modern education. And he himself were to say later on that we have two great cultures from the ancient past which have developed distinct types of human excellences. 
distinct types of human greatness. One is the ancient Hindu, the other the ancient Greek. These two have given very distinctive contributions to human culture. The Hindu has its own uniqueness. The Greek has his own uniqueness. Whatever was achieved by the Greeks, later on by the Romans, we find them in an enlarged form in modern Western culture. Whatever excellences you get in this culture, Swami Vivekananda assimilated into himself. As he had assimilated the excellences of his own ancient culture and continuing tradition, the Hindu. All this he did in a short time. By the time he was 29, he had come to this country. He started his great work and he passed away at the age of 39. But within this short time, to achieve high character excellence and to work to change the minds and attitudes of men and women in two continents, that was great work indeed. In Indian history, we have only one more such example in the 8th century AD, that was Shankara Acharya. Just 32 years of human life, within that period, he really shook up India intellectually and spiritually. In the modern period, India produced this great teacher, Vivekananda. He had a great message to deliver to the modern world, for which he came to this country, or some destiny made him move his steps towards this country. Then he returned to India, conveyed that same message meant for the people of India during the remaining years of his life and he passed away. And we are discussing now Swami Vivekananda and human excellence. What are those elements constituting human excellence that you find in him and that you find in his teachings? We can deal with this from two points of view. One is our human character that we get from a good education. It is understood that education is meant not only to give us knowledge and information, but to build up our character. Here in this university, we had great psychologists like William James, later on William McDougall. They all stressed on this wonderful idea of character building education. Human character, strength of conviction, courage, tremendous humanistic impulse, all these constitute excellences of character. One of his books by McDougall is entitled character and the conduct of life. It's a beautiful book. These are not current nowadays, but at one time there were great books, 20s and 30s. And so, in Swami Vivekananda, education gave him this wonderful character excellence, courage of conviction, tremendous humanistic impulse. This is what Swamiji called the Greek ideal. Greeks also laid great stress on these values. Modern humanism, essentially derived from ancient Greek or Roman humanism, <coughs> with other touches coming in the course of history. But essentially, it makes for education and character strength to be able to handle the world around us 
both nature and man. This is one aspect. Here you have education to do plus education to be. I have used two words which are very, very interesting from the point of view of the new thinking on education that is going on in the post-war period. The UNESCO appointed a commission to investigate education in the post-war period because a lot of changes have come since the Second World War. That commission was presided over by the French Minister of Education, later on Prime Minister. And that commission submitted a report <coughs> after investigating the subject of education and the demands of the modern age. That report has a beautiful title. I especially love that title. It is called Learning to Be. We teach in education learning to do. But this commission says learning to do will remain. But learning to be is still more important. What are you? What have you developed within yourself? What is the nature of your character and the attitudes within you? These are all very important. And so a new dimension to education is added by adding that word to be, learning to be, along with learning to do. Work efficiency we need in today's civilization. It's a highly technical civilization. Education must equip me with tremendous work efficiency. And work efficiency consists of knowledge and translation of knowledge into action. Efficiency is the hallmark of modern civilization. A word that is used again and again. When you go to the Upanishads 4,000 years ago in India, there is a beautiful definition of efficiency given by the Chandogya Upanishad. Here are the words. Yadeva Vidyaya Karoti Shraddhaya Upanishada Tadeva Vedya Vattaram Bhavati Whatever is done with Vidya, Shraddha and Upanishad that alone becomes supremely efficient. What are these three values? Vidya means knowledge. If you want to be efficient, you must have knowledge. What we today call the technical know-how of a thing. A nurse must know the technical know-how of nursing. A doctor must know the same thing. Engineer, so also every other individual concerned. That's called Vidya. First, you need the knowledge of a particular subject, of a discipline, but that is not enough. Mere knowledge doesn't make you efficient, intellectual knowledge. Second is Shraddha, great faith and conviction in your own abilities and in the cause which you are upholding. Then your work becomes still more efficient. So second is Shraddha, men and women of great conviction. Vivekananda were to say later on, great convictions are the mothers of great deeds. Behind every great work, there is tremendous conviction. The world is produced and moved by men and women with convictions. The opposite of conviction is opinion. We may have opinion on any number of subjects. It has no energy. But conviction has energy. All history shaping has been done by men and women of great convictions. The word Shraddha stands for conviction. Opinions are nothing. 
we may have opinions on everything under the sun it won't move the world at all i was reading a scientific book more than 50 years ago where one sentence attracted my attention this is that sentence opinions are the rattles of immature minds the mature minds have no need for them any number of opinions but when you convert an opinion into conviction then it becomes energy the world moves where there is conviction political convictions spiritual convictions social convictions these are all wonderful world moving in power swami vivekananda placed great emphasis on this conviction on shraddha the second word in that statement yadeva vidya karoti vidya means knowledge shraddhaya great faith i have faith in myself i can i can i have faith in the work i am doing i can execute it i can deliver the goods i have faith in the meaningfulness of the world around me if i don't have that third faith i become cynical and no energy will come from me that third faith is essential meaningfulness of human life and the world around us we are missing a lot of it in the modern period more cynical attitudes come because only intellect is sharpened the real excellence in life will not come and so this wonderful combination vidya shraddha and that's not enough upanishad deep thinking upanishad is deep meditation and so any subject that is studied and pondered and meditated upon deeply that becomes a force that character gets a tremendous power giving all these three upanishad says tadeva that alone becomes viryavattaram virya means energy the word taram in sanskrit is comparative and tamam in superlative so tara and tama we call it tara is better tama is best so the best efficiency will come when you combine knowledge with these other two values so in education when all these three are combined you get a type of human excellence which can move this world social change bringing about justice in society the educated citizen is the source from which a modern society receives nourishment that education must include not just intellectual knowledge but these other virtues as well vivekananda therefore spoke of this level of human excellence what we get from school and college what we get from social interactions what type of character is coming out of it strength fearlessness great conviction and a tremendous concern for man the whole thing is human and humanistic without any mystical dimension this is the great ideal that the world has specially found developed in greek or roman culture modern western culture vivekananda was a great admirer of these qualities especially that first one faith in oneself i can do i can do what we call in english and greek language the promethean spirit impossible i shall overcome it i have the strength i have faith in myself vivekananda preached this message so much in india have faith in yourself great convictions are the mothers of great deeds 
don't think that something is impossible. What is impossible today can become possible tomorrow. Never lose faith. To the people of India, he said, why did you fail in recent centuries? Because you had faith in gods and goddesses and you had no faith in yourself. Therefore, you failed. The first faith is faith in oneself. Then only faith in you, faith in gods and other things. If this primary faith is not there, no great thing can come from you. This is stressed again and again in the Indian context. He did not do it in the Western context. He saw it here in the people, in the Western cultural tradition because of that Promethean spark which inspired the Greeks, the Romans and today modern Western civilization. Apart from this, there is a tremendous development for man. Not only are we members of a social community, not only have we a political personality, using the word political as the Greeks used it, polity. You live together in a polity. You take from it, you give to it. You strengthen it. You make it progress. That's called the political view of the human personality where you are with other people. But there is another dimension to human greatness and an excellence comes coming from that level of greatness is also wonderful. That is called the spiritual dimension of human greatness. Something vertical. This is horizontal. We are dealing with other human beings. We are, as Aristotle said, man is a social animal. We need that gregarious background. But man has a vertical dimension. The deepening of his awareness. This is something wonderful. Even in Greek culture, this excellence was given in the famous dictum of the Delphi Oracle. Man, know thyself. It's not enough. You know the external environment. There is a profound inner environment within you. Try to know that. Only one great Greek understood the truth of that Delphic oracle. That was Socrates. He understood his own profound dimension within himself. And the Greeks couldn't understand him. The Athenians could not understand him. Because it was something beyond their comprehension. They were concentrating on this concept of man. The horizontal man in society. Man wrestling with forces outside, establishing his hegemony on the world outside. But the greatness of Socrates was something deep, something subtle. It's a great tragedy that the Greek state could not appreciate Socrates and he had to die. He was described as the corrupter of Athenian youth. What a description. What greatness, but greatness could not be understood. I, whenever I take the example of Socrates and Jesus Christ, he also gave a tremendous message of man's inwardness, his tremendous vertical dimension. Both suffered the same fate. People around couldn't understand such a profound dimension of human greatness. So I remember the remark of Bertrand Russell when he said, if you teach mankind faster they can learn, then you will be in for trouble. That's what he said. So what Socrates said was too high, too fast. Greeks couldn't understand it. But what he said is so understandable to people of India because there that dimension was explored by the number of people, the galaxy of people, the depth dimension of the human personality, the vertical dimension as we call it. So Jesus also the same. If both were in India, 
they would not have suffered that fate. He can take it for granted. They would appreciate it. This is what happened in India. A deepening of man's awareness. In the early period, whatever the Greeks tried to do, Indians did. But that was not their highest. They just went deeper into the human personality. The depth dimension of man and discovered the mortal behind the mortal, the infinite behind the finite, what we call today the spiritual dimension of the human personality. There is something profound as a mystery lurking within man. You can study him from the outside. That won't exhaust him. In the language of our own American scientist who came to, towards the end of the last century, Alexis Carroll. His book is Man the Unknown. It's a beautiful expression. Man the known, man the unknown. That's a challenging study. It is there. India forged ahead in the Upanishads. And when you study the Upanishads, you will find that some of the beautiful passages of Plato giving Socrates dialogues can become chapters in the Upanishads. One such I particularly like, Socrates is drinking poison, disciples are sitting around him, weeping, he consoles them, let me die in peace, don't weep. Then one of them asks a question to Socrates, that was Crito, Socrates, how shall we bury you? Socrates smiles. And he says, you must first catch me, the real me, before you ask that question. Be of good cheer, Crito. You refer to my body. As to the body, do with it as you do with other people. This can be just a passage in any Upanishad. That man has an eternal, immortal dimension. When you realize that truth, you become utterly fearless. You become compassionate. You feel your oneness with all. That greatness, Socrates manifested. That greatness you can see in a Buddha. Today in a Sri Ramakrishna, what a tremendous development it is. From that tradition came a wonderful set of excellences of character. This overcoming of narrowness, Creed and limitation, intolerance and violence, all that come from that level. Not at this level. At the earlier level, many fine qualities can come, many excellences can come, but often these other ones also can come. War, violence, aggression, all can come from that level. But when you go deeper, you go beyond all these aggressive tendencies, full peace and universal compassion come to you because you are in touch with a divine spark that lights up every soul in this world. That's a wonderful idea. In the Upanishads, you get that excellence manifested through that high spiritual development and experience. I don't want to use the word religion for this because as soon as you utter the word religion, some creed, some dogma, some do's and don'ts, even some institutional limitations, that is not. This is an inward penetration. As we penetrate into physical nature, Upanishads told us, penetrate into human nature. You will find something wonderful there. If this world is a great mystery, the world within man is a tremendous mystery and we must know what that mystery is. This tremendous spiritual development of man and the science and technique that lead to it, that was the great contribution of the Upanishads and that became the determinant of all Indian culture up to Sri Ramakrishna in our time. At whose feet 
Vivekananda said. He had assimilated the best of modern thought. A student of Calcutta University, India had been brought in touch with Western culture through the British connection. That British connection was a temporary connection. But this Western culture became a permanent connection with India. Go to any part of the world, nowhere you will find that appreciation hearty of Western culture, Western literature as you find in India. Tremendous appreciation from all levels of people because they know the greatness of this wonderful attitude. They have it in their literature, even their philosophy, but in their later development of culture, these were not stressed. The other thing was stressed, that vertical dimension, that deepening of man's spiritual awareness. And today, Sri Ramakrishna comes, representing the whole gamut of that wonderful spiritual dimension of the human personality. When Romarola presents Ramakrishna to the Western world, in that first volume, Life of Ramakrishna, a word to my Western readers, he says, two beautiful passages are there. I bring to Europe, as yet unaware of it, the spirit of a new autumn, the spirit of India, the symphony of the soul, bearing the name Ramakrishna. I bring it to a Europe that has murdered sleep. I bring it to a Europe to wet its lips with the waters of immortality. What language? A great artist, author of The Life of Beethoven, Nobel Prize winner in literature, writer of a book on Gandhi, that was Romarola. But he found in Ramakrishna and Vivekananda something unique and this book is the best critical study, appreciative study of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. In that second passage, Pumarvala says, Ramakrishna is the consummation of the 2000 year spiritual life of 300 billion people. What a wonderful study of a great teacher. This Sri Ramakrishna represents man's spiritual life. Not a creed, not a dogma. Wherever there has been a spiritual striving, Sri Ramakrishna found that striving manifested in his own striving. Our great Indian poet, Rabindranath Tagore, himself an internationalist, a Nobel Prize winner for literature, he has given the tribute to Sri Ramakrishna in a small Bengali poem which he wrote during Ramakrishna's centenary 1936-37. Ramakrishna's life was 1836-1886. Vivekananda 1863-1902. Most eventful period of human history, the 19th century. Tagore has presented Ramakrishna in this light. In Bengali he says, Bahu sadhaker, Bahu sadhana adhara, Dhyane tomar, Milito hoye chetara. The meditations and worship and adorations of millions of devotees have flown and mingled in your meditation. Tomarji vene rasi meir lila pathe, nodan tirthurup nilo eja pathe. In the infinite expanse of your life, the world is blessed with a new shrine of unity, a new place of pilgrimage. Deshe videshe pranam anilotani, shetai amai pranthidilam yani. That wonderful shrine of unity is drawing salutations from men and women from far and wide, to which I add my own salutation. 
that is Sri Ramakrishna's status as a spiritual experimenter and a spiritual teacher. Universality is the one characteristic of that spirituality. No sectarian differences, no cradle differences, pure spiritual unity, harmony, concord. They represented the spirit of Indian culture, harmony, tolerance, concord, from Rigveda up to Ramakrishna. It's a continuous tradition of harmony and concord in the world of religion. In the 3rd century BC, India had a great emperor, Ashoka, the Mauryan emperor, whose empire extended from southern Russia, north of Afghanistan, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, the whole of India, up to far south of India, a mighty empire. In that empire, this great emperor Ashoka spread the message of perfect tolerance and understanding in the world of religion. He wrote edicts on rocks and pillars. The edict on toleration is marvelous, historical. Just a simple Sanskrit phrase he has used there. Samavaya eva sadhu. In religion, concord alone is correct, not discord, not intolerance, not violence, only concord. The influence of Indian culture, philosophy, and the political policies of several of the states in India have been tremendous on the Indian mind. Tolerance and understanding in the world of religion has become the hallmark of the people for centuries and centuries together. It was that spirit of India that found embodied in Sri Ramakrishna. The spiritual dimension of the human personality on the one side, tremendous harmony in the world of religion on the other, both became embodied in Sri Ramakrishna. At his feet, Vivekananda said, for full five years. What need had he to sit at the feet of a person like that? When we deal with Vivekananda and human excellence, this will be an important subject. A man brilliant in intellect, who studied the best of modern literature, our own ancient literature, a brilliant mind. What more do you want? He had courage, fearlessness, Tremendous human compassion. What more did he need in, stand in need of? And yet, you find to complete his education, he goes to Sri Ramakrishna. With all these equipments, Ramakrishna had none of these equipments. He had not even ordinary, simple school education. And yet, Ramakrishna was highly educated in another sphere the entire inner world of man. Outwardly he was very ordinary, inwardly he was extraordinary. And Vivekananda, after getting all this modern education, including that Greco-Roman culture, which he got through Western contact, he goes to Ramakrishna and gets a fuller education. And when he went in, he went in as student Narendra. When he came out of Ramakrishna's university, you can call it, he came out as Vivekananda. A beautiful harmony of many conflicting forces in the modern world. East and West, ancient modern, faith and reason, religion and science, these are all in conflict. But through Ramakrishna's blessing and training, Vivekananda developed this wonderful harmony within himself. That sentence of Ramarola, I must repeat, he was the harmony of all human energy. That is Vivekananda. When he wandered over this great country, 83 to 86, people saw in him 
a tremendous personality. Force of personality. Force to uplift, not to pull down. There was a great American friend of Swami Vivekananda here, Miss Josephine McLeod. She was also connected with England. Her memoirs are there, not published in what you call printed form, but in circulation. I was reading a passage there, Miss McLeod telling, I have seen two great people in this modern world, he said. One was Kaiser, Emperor Kaiser of Germany, second was Vivekananda. What is the difference between the two? When you stand before Kaiser, you become very small. When you stand before Vivekananda, you become very big. That is the greatness. That's called spiritual greatness. Ordinary worldly greatness, spiritual greatness. That is the one criterion. Before any worldly greatness, you feel small. Before any spiritual greatness like Vivekananda, you feel elevated. You feel strengthened. What must be the reason for it? Because though they look like individuals, they have achieved a universality in themselves. They are one with you, they are one with you, they are one with all. That is what makes for that wonderful elevating power coming from such greatness. You have the mother at home. A baby standing before a mother feels quite big in itself because there is no distance between the baby and the mother. Love is the only context there. So our human life today must understand this new dimension of human greatness, human excellence. All the worldly excellence we may have, beautiful they are. But you can go one step further. Make that excellence of a new type with a type of godliness, spirituality. That is what Vivekananda represented when he went through the various cities of this great country. He can read the reminiscences of people who saw him, heard him, moved intimately with him. The reminiscences of Vivekananda, who were young girls at the time, young boys at the time. Later on, they grew up and they remembered their connection with Vivekananda. All of them have written in that book, Eastern and Western people who had some contact with Vivekananda. That is the famous book, Reminiscences of Vivekananda. Human excellence that found expression in this human personality had something tremendous about it. It felt a tremendous impact it left on the person concerned, elevating, strengthening. That is because, as I said, he combined within himself the best of modern character excellence and the best of Indian, ancient Indian character excellence. This he could do so through the influence of Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna was universal. He had great respect for Narendra representing the modern Western spirit. Ramakrishna had profound respect for this quality. And yet he knew there is something higher, there is something higher. We need a combination. In every character, when I quoted the title of that UNESCO book on education, Learning to Be, I meant this particular new thinking on education, learning to do and learning to be. If you can synthesize, you are the best of education. There, education and religion blend together. Religion and spiritual growth, development, fulfillment. Not as ethnical religion, which we have plenty in the world. Vivekananda was later on to write about these ethnical religions that were played in the world. In a letter from America to India, he wrote, Religions of the world have become lifeless mockeries. 
what we want is character. In the name of these religions like Hindu, Muslim, Christian, we can do any number of wicked deeds. Still we are religious. What is this kind of religion? A religion that makes you grow spiritually. That is the science of religion. Science of human growth, development, fulfillment. Ramakrishna came to stimulate that idea of religion, that spirit of religion. Vivekananda spread that idea throughout the world. When you combine these two elements of human excellences, what happens to you? There are several passages in Vivekananda's literature dealing with the spirit of religion. Vivekananda spread that idea throughout the world. When you combine these two elements of human excellences, what happens to you? There are several passages in Vivekananda's literature dealing with the resultant character excellence coming from this beautiful blending. In one place he says, Can you become an Occidental of Occidentals in your spirit of freedom, equality, energy and work and yet remain Hindu to the backbone in spiritual culture and instincts, you are all born to achieve that harmony. Work efficiency, social efficiency, all this you must get and yet a tremendous inwardness, a touch of the divine within through the capacity for meditation. Then character excellence comes of the highest type. Another section, Vivekananda says, when we have faith in religion, we become very deep, very firm and very fanatic as well. Whenever you have deep faith in religion, you become fanatic. And as soon as you become broad and cosmopolitan as we say, you lose all intensity of feeling, all intensity of religious faith, you become a goody-goody cosmopolitan. These are the two choices before man till now. Take European history. When people were full of faith, they were full of intolerance. They will just kill others for nothing. Organize crusades, kill all the witches or other denominations. That's called the age of faith. But then came tolerance and acts of toleration passed by every legislature, France, England, etc. Why? I lost interest in religion. I don't care what happens, it's a nonsense. I become very liberal. These are the choices. Either you are intense with faith and intolerance or you are liberal without any faith. Can you combine these two? Vivekananda says the highest human excellence will come when you, com you combine, he calls it, the intensity of the fanatic with the extensity of the materialist. The wonderful language he has used. Can you combine these two? The intensity of the fanatic and the extensity of the materialist. That is the great contribution of Vedanta. When he preached Vedanta here, he brought out of that philosophy this character excellence. Deep faith and yet tremendous concern for others, tremendous respect for other religions that has been India's experience throughout the ages. People have been deeply religious and out of that deep depth of religion they respected other religions as well. That is Ashoka's inscription. That's also expressed in many many passages in the Indian books that out of faith must come a liberal attitude. What must be that faith? Free from creed and limitation, free from sectarian limitation. That is the Advaitic vision that India developed in her Upanishads. That vision of oneness. From there alone you can have this infinite compassion, this infinite tolerance and understanding. That is the great development that took place in the Upanishads 
that was continued to be nourished by subsequent great students and teachers of religion until it found a tremendous expression in Sri Ramakrishna. And in this spirit of tolerance, there is such a comprehensiveness that not only tolerating different religions, but tolerating and respecting agnosticism and atheism as well. That is something wonderful. Vedanta wants us to respect the atheist and the agnostic as well. And not only all believers. What must be that excellence of character where you have this tremendous universal attitude, sympathy, understanding. Ramakrishna himself was an embodiment of that universality. To him went not only men and women of faith, but men and women of unbelief, of agnostic minds, scientific minds, they also went to Ramakrishna and he welcomed all of them. That is where you get the highest type of human excellence. A second rare combination of human excellence is to combine strength and fearlessness on the one side and gentleness and peace on the other. In human character, if you can combine fearlessness and gentleness, that will be the highest human excellence. Very rare to combine. When you are fearless, you are fearful to others. When you are gentle, you are afraid of others. This is the choice before humanity. Gentle like a cow, frightened by everything in the forest. But fierce like a lion, frightening everybody else. This is what we see in human character. But Vedanta speaks of this new competition. Vivekananda embodied it in himself. In Ramakrishna it was fully blazing. Infinite strength and infinite gentleness and compassion. What a beautiful combination. And so in the Gita, there is a beautiful verse. Krishna is describing, who is my true devotee? Today's religions, which are now fighting with each other in all parts of the world, including India, if only they understand this truth a little bit, what a change will come. Yasman no dvijate loko Lokan no dvijate chayaha He whom the world cannot frighten and he who does not frighten the world. That is my true devotee. He is so strong, nobody can frighten him. He is so gentle, no evil will come to anybody from him. A bit of that you saw when you witnessed the Gandhi film. There you will find the effort to combine these two difficult virtues, fearlessness and gentleness, non-violence and tremendous strength. India had learned this lesson from our great masters, from ancient to modern times. One result of that learning has been a uniformly non-aggressive foreign relations of India for 4,000 years. Though it had great political states, great empires, great military strength, but not once did India go out of the country to conquer other nations. That has been highlighted by Ashoka himself. Let us silence the war drums. Let us sound the kettle drums of peace. This is one of the edicts of Ashoka. That was told 3rd century BC, so early period of human history. So this continual education by the sages on the one side and political states on the other made possible the confluence of several religions in India and the state supporting all of them without any discrimination. One of our great thinkers was Dr. S. Radha Krishnan, who was often lecturing in Oxford University, who was finally 
the president of India before he passed away. He defines the Indian concept of toleration in a beautiful sentence in his remarkable book, Eastern Religions and Western Thought. These are lectures delivered in Oxford University, scholarly, lucid, with plenty of information. This is the definition. Toleration is the homage that the finite mind pays to the inexhaustibility of the infinite. If God is infinite and inexhaustible, if you have an experience of God, you can't say, I take a copyright of God in my experience. He is infinite. Others also can have an experience. Still others can have experience. And yet he is still infinite, inexhaustible. That attitude alone can make you truly tolerant in the sense of accepting other people's experiences. Toleration as acceptance. There you have another type of human excellence which the world needs very much today. The whole of Vivekananda's career and in many writings he has expressed this idea of idea of toleration. The last note that he struck in his Parliament of Religion lectures from 11 September to 27 September 1893, the last note was this note. On the banner of every religion will soon be written, in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace and not dissension. Beautiful language and how prophetic. From 1893 to today, you can see the slow permeation of this idea into the religions of the world. Today we are able to talk about dialogue between religions. The Vatican has a department for it. A big change is coming on the face of religion. The fallout has come from there. The tremendous message he delivered here so that religion which is so profound an experience of man should not become poisoned at the source itself through violence and intolerance then only it can really deliver the goods so this excellence is another wonderful constituent of total human excellence Vivekananda represented within himself and taught it to the world. These are wonderful ideas. This subject is fascinating from several points of view. I do not want to go much more into it because Swamiji's books are there. He emphasized this point again and again. Our education must combine these two types of excellences, Greek or Roman or Western, the spiritual as represented in India's age-old tradition, as represented in the mystical heights of every religion, Christian, Sufi and all, that is the spirit that must come to education, then we shall have human excellence as current coin in society. We do get here and there some aspects of excellence, but today's education must be much more powerful to bring out of man all these sleeping excellences. In one lecture, Vivekananda sent out this exhortation, teach yourselves, teach everyone his real nature, call upon the sleeping soul and see how it will awake. Power will come, glory will come, purity will come, strength will come. Everything great and excellent will come when this sleeping soul is roused to self-conscious activity. How to rouse the spiritual awareness of humanity? That was his main theme and towards the end he said, I may die, but I shall not cease to teach. I shall continue to inspire men and women everywhere 
until humanity will know that it is one with God. There you will have that total human excellence. With this quality within, if you work as a scientist in a laboratory, a politician in the political field, social worker in the social field, simple housewife at home, what a different person you will be. How rich within, how influential to bring the world to peace and well-being you will be. That is Vivekananda's tremendous contribution, not only in teaching, much more in example. Especially in the world of religion, example is more important than teaching. A teacher must exemplify what he teaches. In any other subject, you may be anything else, but not so in the field of religion. There was a great poet and mystic in India about 1400 years ago. His name was Bhatra Hari. Swami Vivekananda quotes him because some of his utterances are full of wisdom. One such wisdom relates to the types of being human beings in a society. Not any particular society. Take any society. What are the types of people that are there in that society? It is a wonderful statement by this poet and saint and mystic Bhartra Hari. It comes in his book Neeti Shatakam, 100 verses on ethics and morality. There comes this verse. Eke Sat Purusha Parartha Ghataka Swarthan Parityajaye Samanyastu Parartha Muddhima Brata Swartha Virodhe Naye Temi Manavarakshasa Parahitam Swartha in Ignandi Yetup Nandi Nerathakam Parahitam Teke Najani Mahe Swamiji used to going to ecstasy, referring to this particular verse and its sentiment. The verse says, there are four types of people in every society. The difference between society and society is not about the types, but the ratio between the types. In one society, one may be more, another type may be less, a third type may be still less. That's all the difference between society and society. That will become clear when you understand what are these types. The first type, A.K. First, A.K. means one. Sat Purusha. They are called the good people, the true people. Sat means good and true in Sanskrit. Sat Purusha. You often use the word Satsang. Company of good people. That's called Satsang with bhajan and all that. A.K. Sat Purusha. They are called Sat Purusha. Good people. Why are they called good people? Paraartha Ghataka. They are always interested to bring happiness and cheer to other people. That's called Satpurusha. Not only so, Swarthan Parityajyaye. They forsake their own self-interest to ensure the interest and welfare of other people. They are called the Satpurushas, the first type in any society. They are always a minority. Only a small number of people can be. But as Jesus puts it, they are the salt of the earth. They must be there. Eke Sat Purusha Paratha Gataka. What can I do for you? I don't care what happens to me, but I want to know what happens to you. I am here to help you, to serve you. Swartha and Paritya Jaye. A Mahatma Gandhi. He could have made plenty of money. But he goes to jail to release people living a prison life within the nation. That's what Gandhi did. That's wonderful. He had nothing to gain for himself. This is the first time. Every society will have a small minority of this type. Then comes the second type. Samanya they are called. Generality. Samanya is the word for generality the majority. Samanyastu Parartham Uddhima Brataha 
they are also interested to serve the interest of others to help others to work for others but one difference without forsaking their own self interest they will protect their self interest with surplus time and energy they will try to serve other people this is the concept of what we call a citizen in modern democracies a citizen cares for his own family for her own family but with every surplus energy he or she takes account of the welfare of the whole state as well that's called citizenship awareness in a democracy in british political philosophy they have a particular name for this second class they call it enlightened self interest self interest is there but it is enlightened it's not crass self interest but enlightened self interest i often feel today in the international world foreign aid serving the backward nations is an example of this enlightened self interest it is to the interest of the highly developed societies to see that there are no weak societies anywhere because humanity is one so this enlightened self interest is a beautiful philosophy for working purposes though it can be corrupted by erosion of enlightenment increase of self interest then everything will go wrong very interesting subject this second quality bernard shaw has made fun of this enlightened self interest philosophy especially developed by english political philosophers in the 19th century he has written a drama called the man of destiny on napoleon very interesting drama there napoleon is in italy doing his campaigns he comes com- comes across an english lady and bernard shaw often makes fun of john bull that is english people so in this drama he makes a little fun so he comes across this english lady hello what are you from i am from england oh wonderful you are a wonderful people you english people napoleon says i can defeat the whole world but i cannot defeat these english people wonderful they are why do you say so she asked because you do everything on principles that's why we, i am afraid to deal with you i cannot defeat you whatever the british do only on principles they will do what do you mean she asked you obey your king on loyal principles you rebel against the king on patriotic principles you cut off the head of your king on republican principles you loot and burn half the world on commercial principles you are wonderful you are wonderful he said then he added but you are very clever you are always clever to see that your principles are on the side of your own self interest <laughs> that is a famous passage of bernard shaw on the english people his own people though he is irish man of destiny by refer to this principle of enlightened self interest as a working principle for human life i cannot forsake my interest i am a household I have to run my family but i can concern myself with others to some extent that's called enlightened self interest they are called as amanya generality a beautiful type but to be alert so that that self interest doesn't overpower that little enlightenment that is there alertness alone can help us to retain that enlightenment ingredient then comes the third category the poet is finding difficult to or finding words difficult to describe but he calls them temi manava rakshasa the third category are devils among men demons among men manava rakshasa rakshasa is the word for a demon in the form of man he is a rakshasa why parahitam swarthai nidhantiye to gain some advantage for oneself they destroy other people's happiness and welfare they are called manava rakshasa how did they become so when the enlightened self interest 
gets enlightenment eroded by want of attention and alertness to slide into the third category. Just exploit, aggressive, trying to fatten yourself at the cost of others. In India, I can, I can tell many examples. People have come this to this Manwar Akshasa type since independence. Those who are literate food and medicine, for example, what do they care? I get my profit. I don't care what happens to others. So this is the type Manava Rakshasa, the poet says. But he could still describe him. The fourth one he says, I am at a loss to describe him. Why? Yetu Ghanti Nirarthakam Parahitam Teke Na Jani Mahe. What shall I say about that type of people? Without gaining any advantage for oneself, they destroy other people's happiness and welfare. The vandalistic type. Just destructive. Now, having referred to these four, Bhartriyari tells us, this is a social mirror. Everyone must look one's own face in that mirror. To which category do I belong? That would be very good for society. Every child must be given this mirror. Boy, girl, what face do you want to see in this mirror? You will see only what you are. Exactly what you are, you will see in this mirror. First, second, beautiful. Never the third, never the fourth. Belong to the first category or second category. What a beautiful idea. Vivekananda loved this classification. And he felt a good education under a full philosophy of human development where you combine sciences and spirituality Spirituality itself is a science of man in depth. So physical science and spirituality you combine, you develop a new society where you will have plenty of the second type and many more of the first type. Very few of the third and none of the fourth. That is the objective of every true education. The UNESCO suggestion just a gentle hint only that education should be learning to be plus learning to do, not merely learning to do. This is just the beginning of new dimensions in education, which I am sure by the time this century rolls off and then next century begins, men and women will come to realize that that deepening is necessary. Presiding over that tremendous development will be this one universal personality, Vivekananda. The whole world can look up to him, yes. He was a universal person. He belonged to no nation, no particular group. His sympathies were worldwide. When he was in America for four years, people wrote to him from India, how long are you going to stay here? You have a lot of work to do in India, come soon. And he replies beautifully in the letter you will find. What is England, India or America to us? We are the worshippers of that God whom the ignorant call man. When you pour water at the root of the tree, don't you water the whole tree? What a beautiful conception. If I serve man here, I serve man everywhere. I don't belong to any particular nation. God and truth are the only thing I serve and nothing else. These are the words of Vivekananda. That's why Roma Rola presented both Ramakrishna and Vivekananda in that introduction word to my Western readers as the splendid symphony of the universal soul, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda. That is the subject, Vivekananda and human excellence. When I see our children all over this world, all over India you go, Australia, America, Europe, beautiful children, lovable, sweet, I call them angels. How to make them retain this excellence and develop other excellences? What type of education can bring about this wonderful development in our children? You will get the answer. This combination of spirituality, physical science, protective efficiency, inward spiritual efficiency. These two must combine. That is the message of Vivekananda.
for all east and west everywhere he preached a tremendous message of humanism rooted in the divine spark in every human being we have humanism in the greco roman period we have christian humanism but limited by creedal affiliations we have modern scientific humanism without any depth in it and we had the two wars which simply blasted away all faith in man also here is vivekananda bringing this message of a profound deep humanism based upon the divine spark in every human being and education and the life process and the work process helping us to unfold that divine possibility that is vivekananda's way for human excellence for all children in all parts of the world it will take time but he is the great thinker standing before modern humanity it is said of athens that athens was the school of all hellas all the greek countries had athens as the school today we can say vivekananda is the education for the whole of modern humanity but it will take time for modern humanity to understand it and appreciate it great things do not come so quickly but they do act and that's what we can see in the next century in india something big has happened in a very humble way just a few months ago the state in india presented before the youth of india vivekananda as their model and example in october 84 government of india proclaimed this is international youth year vivekananda's birthday on january 12th will every year be the youth day and that will be the youth week for the people of india for the children of india the result was tremendous enthusiasm the president of india the prime minister of india joining in celebrations of january 12th to bring to the young people this wonderful personality learn from him you will be great nothing petty and small will stay with you religious broad attitudes non communal attitudes practical work efficiency joining of east and west in your own character all these beautiful things will come to you a mankind awareness will come to you through swami vivekananda if this step is followed by further steps and india can reshape her education which is still of that colonial type not much new change has come over it and everybody is dissatisfied with it if this can take place it be a tremendous thing for the 700 million people of india and that means one sixth of humanity therefore i conclude my speech by sharing with you this information that young people have an ideal to look to by which they will grow broader in humanistic